Going for a Beer by Robert Coover He finds himself sitting in the neighborhood bar drinking a beer at about the same time that he began to think about going there for one. In fact, he has finished it. Perhaps he'll have a second one, he thinks, as he downs it and asks for a third. There is a young woman sitting not far from him who is not exactly good-looking, but good-looking enough, and probably good in bed, as indeed she is. Did he finish his beer? Can't remember. What really matters is, did he enjoy his orgasm, or even have one? This he is wondering on his way home through the foggy night streets from the young woman's apartment, which was full of Cupid dolls, the sort one at carnivals, and they made a date, as he recalls, to go to one. Where she wins another, she has a knack for it. Whereupon they're in her apartment again, taking their clothes off, she excitedly cuddling her new doll in a bed heaped with them. He can't remember when he last slept, and he's no longer sure, as he staggers through the night streets, still foggy, where his own apartment is, his orgasm, if he had one, already fading from memory. Maybe he should take her back to the carnival, he thinks, where she wins another Cupid doll. This is at least their second date, maybe their fourth, and this time they go for a romantic nightcap at the bar where they first met, where a brawny dude starts hassling her. He intervenes, and she turns up at his hospital bed, bringing him one of her Cupid dolls to keep him company, which is her way of expressing the bond between them, or so he supposes, as he leaves the hospital on crutches, uncertain what part of town he is in, or what part of the year. He decides that it's time to call the affair off. She's driving him crazy. But then the brawny dude turns up at their wedding and apologizes for the pounding he gave him. He didn't realize, he says, how serious they were. The guy's wedding present is a gift certificate for two free drinks at the bar where they met and a pair of white satin ribbons for his crutches. During the ceremony, they both carry Cupid dolls that probably have some barely hidden significance, and indeed do. The child she bears him his or another's, reminds him, as if he needed reminding, that time is fast moving on. He has responsibilities now, and he decides to check whether he still has the job that he had when he first met her. He does. His absence, if he has been absent, is not remarked on, but he is not congratulated on his marriage either, no doubt because it comes back to him now. Before he met his wife, he was engaged to one of his colleagues, and their co-workers had already thrown them an engagement party, so they must resent the money they spent on gifts. It's embarrassing, and the atmosphere is somewhat hostile, but he has a child in kindergarten and another on the way, so what can he do? Well, he still hasn't cashed in the gift certificate, so for one thing, what the hell, he can go for a beer, two in fact, and he can afford a third. There's a young woman sitting near him who looks like she's probably good in bed, but she's not his wife and he has no desire to commit adultery, or so he tells himself as he sits on the edge of her bed with his pants around his ankles. Is he taking them off or putting them on? He's not sure, but now he pulls them on and limps home, having left his beribboned crutches somewhere. On arrival, he finds all the Cupid dolls, which were put on a shelf when the baby started coming, now scattered about the apartment, beheaded and with their limbs amputated. One of the babies is crying, so while he warms up a bottle of milk on the stove, he goes into its room to give it a pacifier and discovers a note from his wife pinned to its pajamas, which says that she has gone off to the hospital to have another baby, and she'd better not find him here when she gets back, because if she does, she'll kill him. He believes her, so he's soon out on the streets again, wondering if he ever gave that bottle to the baby, or if it's still boiling away on the stove. 
He passes the old neighborhood bar and is tempted, but decides that he has had enough trouble for one lifetime, and is about to walk on when he is stopped by that Hulk who beat him up and who now gives him a cigar because he's just become a father and drags him into the bar for a celebratory drink, or rather, several. He has lost count. The celebrations are already over, however, and the new father, who has married the same woman who threw him out, is crying in his beer about the miseries of married life and congratulating him on being well out of it, a lucky man. But he doesn't feel lucky, especially when he sees a young woman sitting near them who looks like she's probably good in bed and decides to suggest that they go to her place, but too late, she's already out the door with the guy who beat him up and stole his wife. So he has another beer, wondering where he's supposed to live now, and realizing it's the bartender who so remarks while offering him another on the house, that life is short and brutal and before he knows it he'll be dead. He's right. After a few more beers and orgasms, some vaguely remembered, most not, one of his sons, now a race car driver and the president of the company he used to work for, comes to visit him on his deathbed and, apologizing for arriving so late, I went for a beer, Dad, things happened, says he's going to miss him, but it's probably for the best. For the best what? he asks, but his son is gone if he was ever there in the first place. Well, you know, life, he says to the nurse who has come to pull the sheet over his face and wheel him away.